Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Bolin, President Emeritus of KQED, a member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and your moderator for today's virtual program. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We appreciate your considering a donation to support the Commonwealth Club's work, and if you wish to do so, please click the blue donate button at the top of your YouTube chat box or visit the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. We also want to remind you to submit your questions via the chat room next to your screen, and I'll get to as many of them as possible later in the program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our very special guest, Peter Coyote, award-winning actor, prolific narrator, and author of the new book of poetry, Tongue of a Crow, and the forthcoming book, The Lone Ranger and Tonto Meet Buddha, Masks, Meditation, and Improvised Play to Induce Liberated States. Peter Coyote, of course, has acted in more than 130 films, including E.T., The Extraterrestrial, Cross, Tree, Cross Creek, Jagged Edge, Patch Adams, Aaron Brockovich, and Hemingway and Gellhorn. He's also an Emmy Award-winning narrator of more than 200 documentaries, including for Ken Burns, The West, The National Parks, Prohibition, The Dust Bowl, The Roosevelts, The Vietnam War, The Mayo Clinic, and Country Music. And he is a political activist, singer-songwriter, and importantly for this conversation, a Buddhist priest. He's also a writer, having penned two memoirs, and he is now the author of a new book of poetry, Tongue of a Crow, and the forthcoming December book, The Lone Ranger and Tonto Meet Buddha, Masks, Meditation, and Improvised Play to Induce Liberated States, in which he reveals how to use masks, meditation, and improvisation to free yourself from overthinking, self-doubt, and fixed ideas of who you think you are. Today, I'm so pleased to talk with him about his amazing life, career, and particularly these two new books. Welcome, Peter. John, thank you so much. It's really nice to be back at the Commonwealth Club. I'd like to thank uh, George Boland and the, the Dobbins and the team there for uh, bringing me back. I think this may be the third time. So Tongue of the Crow is now out. Tongue of a Crow is now out. So I thought we'd start there. You've written previous books but this is your first book of poetry. Have you always written poetry? And what was the genesis of this book? Sure. <clears throat> well, I came here in 1964 to work with a poet named Robert Duncan uh, in pursuit of a master's at San Francisco State Creative Writers Workshop. And uh, I came at the cusp of the 60s as the 60s was being engendered and, and coming into full flower. And I have to say that graduate school palled, and it wasn't long before I was in the streets and in the San Francisco Mime Troupe and helping to found the diggers and was off and running for a decade. And uh, But I always wrote poems. I continued to write. And about five years ago, when I turned 75, I opened this drawer that was completely stuffed with papers and scraps and poems, 50 years work. And I had a surge of compassion for my children, who I imagined uh, sentimentally mourning for their poor beloved father and having to go through this pile of crap and not knowing what to do with it. So I wrote to uh, some friends and I elicited help and I finally wound up working with a brilliant uh, poetry teacher and poet named Patrick Donnelly in Massachusetts. And we started working on about five poems together every two weeks. And he is uh, 
brilliant and pitiless. And he would sometimes take a page of single space text and find the one paragraph that constituted the poem. And in the course of several years of work with him, I actually learned much more than I would have learned in graduate school. And so this, this little book uh, has 50, covers 50 years span, but um, there are poets, for, there are poems from the, early, the late 60s all the way up to today. And I'm still sending him poems and have my eye on a second book. So this is like a 50 year shoe dropping. Wow. And uh, where did the title come from, Tongue of a Crow? Uh, it's a line in one of the poems. Let's start in the 60s. Um, in, uh, in, the 19, in 1969, The Grateful Dead gave me a ticket and sent me to London with Ken Kesey and his group and a couple of Hells Angels and some of the diggers to assess the Beatles and to figure out if they were as culturally hip as they were musically hip. And we were a ragged bunch. Let's just put it, put it that way. So this poem is called London Run, and this was written in 1969. And there's a little preface. <clears throat> Having been flown to London by the Grateful Dead with Ken Kesey and company and two Hells Angels and their motorcycles, in 1969, to assess the Beatles' cultural hipness and introduce the San Francisco scene to Europe. 6 December, London. Gray, junky, pallor sky. 12 to feed and house. Apple office, first stop. Timid George, the skinny one, suggests a cheap hotel where they take anybody. Keezy, gone for days. This morning's script croaker, his mad maiden aunt and psychotic kid, scratching and washing invisible sores, rents us a flat. Room for eight, plus maiden aunt and speed freak. 81 Prince of Wales mansions, sandwiched between Kensington and Battersea bridges. Shabby funland across the road, chained for winter. Moldy furs, McVitie's biscuits, Typhoon tea, trainers, strainer brood, jacks, legal pharmaceutical heroin, more effective than the weak heater, eating shillings. Speed freak litter of candy bars, squashed butts, soiled clothes scattered around the stately manse. The sallow motherly clutter for our brood of feral West Coast birds. Stanley Mouse painting the tanks of the Hells Angels choppers parked in the chilled foyer. My little English Jenny Wren, her leather coat and urchin scarf, breast pale as talcum powder, brushes and ties up my hair, laughing, prodding me awake. My loneliness for California's damp green hills and fog. I wish I could fly her home, patchouli-scented Saturday, desk in a high London window painted shut behind me, Sweet William's eyes closed, dropping cigarette ashes on his clothes. Battersea, they call it. Battered orphans of the wars at home. Sea, the sound of oceans we've crossed in our fretful goings and comings, seeking a new world. It's yeah. wonderful to hear that poem in your very famous voice. Ah. Well, that voice uh, killed my career as a bank robber, John. <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a more current one. It's called World on Fire. Tarnished silver sky, a lid on the salt marsh. Clouds steam over the far hills, stingy with rain. Geese, egrets, herons, pigments, smeared across the sky. The last pelican, the last small birds, each panting breath begging the rain. Morning's last damp hope evaporates. A scalding ray pierces the clouds, ignites the bush beside me, orange berries blazing, as if I needed reminding the world is burning. 
And that yeah. certainly brings us right up to today, especially up in the North Bay where we are, uh, hoping that we don't and face that this year. I'll read you one more, and this brings us all the way up through Trump. <laughs> this is called The Burned Oak. They rooted too long during the war, ate the tender shoots after the forest burned, the water fouled. Mount a watch, herd what swine are left into the rusty pen, make a gate from the old barn boards, women wet the knives. The oldest boy chooses, shoots it in the head, a 22 will do the job, but it may scream. Force a sharpened rod between back leg, tendon, and bone. Hoist it into the burned oak. Cut the throat. Drain the blood into a bucket, if you can find one. Pour scalding water down the body. Scrape the hair off the skin. Take a sharp blade. Slice the belly open. Move the organ meat to the kid's wagon. Squeeze the guts clean, wash for winter sausage. We need something like a barrel to pack what we don't eat with salt in case the generator goes, in case we have to fight again. So this is uh, Tongue of a Crow, and it's out now. Yeah, I wish I could find the one um where the quote is i'm going to just look while you ask me the next question well what i was thinking of doing was getting on to the next book the, the oh okay so much there's so much there the, the title alone is intriguing the lone ranger and tanto meet buddha uh, and i love the running parable that runs through the book and it really kind of take carries you through the lone ranger and tanto are lost in the desert for decades after their show is canceled and they meet Buddha. Now, where, where did that idea come from? Uh, it came from over the spinal telephone somewhere. I don't know where it came from. So they see Buddha camped, and they're disheveled. The horses are lame. It's just they're lost in Hollywood, ex-Hollywood hell. And Buddha jumps up, and he takes such impeccable care of the horses and opens, turns the saddles upside down, and he gives them tea and some kind of seed bread he's made. The Lone Ranger deduces that he must be the servant of a very wealthy man because he's very well trained. And he decides with Tonto, that, who's a little nervous about taking anything from this obviously impoverished little brown-skinned man, the Lone Ranger decides they should stay because they might get a loan to go back to Hollywood. The guy might even be an investor in their next film. And the Buddha reads them exactly. He just sees exactly what's going on. And little by little by little, he pulls them in. And as we go through this, this sequence, it's a lighthearted explanation of every human foible and suffering and problem you can have. And one by one, the Buddha gets them to meditate, and each one has their own enlightenment awakening. And uh, at the end of the at the end of the story, the Buddha and the Lone Ranger are wandering off together as kind of pals. And the Lone Ranger asks him if he's ever considered show business. Okay. Uh, there's there's a lot of kind of Buddhist philosophy and stuff you have to get in the serious part of the book. And I thought that this would be a fun and easy way to show people kind of what liberation can look like and how the Lone Ranger has all the problems of a privileged white man. Tonto has all the problems of any human being on earth and uh, that people might be able to read between the two and get what I was talking about. Yeah. And it definitely worked that way for me, because as you say, there's a lot of work in the rest, rest of the book. I mean, there's a lot of learning and there's a lot of exercises and, you know, things to tackle, but the parable sort of also provided comic relief for me as a reader. Uh, yeah. The Buddha really has a great sense of humor the and, Buddha has uh, and then doesn't take himself or the practice very seriously, you know, or overly seriously. Is that true? Is that how you see Buddha? Uh, 
you know, you're Buddha, John. I'm Buddha. We're all, Buddha represents our internal wisdom. And as soon as we can step aside from our personality a little bit, which over a lifetime of being told who we are, implying who we are by how people respond to us, we tend to turn it into a thing, a solid thing. And one of the things that Buddha taught was there's no fixed self, that your self is an awareness. And consequently, there's, there's nothing but your habits. You are free to change them if you know that. And once you, once you step aside from your personality or learn how to do that repeatedly, uh, you're not carrying all the weight of your past mistakes and what mom did and what dad did and, you know, what your wife said this morning. And what arises is ebullience and fun and appreciation for the magical world we inhabit. And actually, I think it's pretty uh, original, your use of masks in combination with meditation. T tell us about how you discovered the power of masks when you were very young and with the San Francisco Mime Troupe. Okay. Um, so I, 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 I'd been, I'd been working in a, the kind of defunct actors workshop in San Francisco, which had been called to New York to start Lincoln Center by Blau and Irving, the two brilliant guys that started it. And there was sort of a moribund company of people hanging on, trying to make it work. And, uh, we did a, we did a big play by Brecht, a big premiere and, I was a photographer. I did 80 photographs of rehearsals, preparations, production, mounted them at my own expense, put them in the lobby, and nobody said a word. Nobody said thanks. Nobody said, gee, it made the lobby look great. So we were renting our smaller theater, the Encore Theater down on Mason Street, to this little company, and I wandered down one day to look at it. And here were photographs of these fabulous-looking women and people out in the parks and low cut bodies and, you know, people in masks and playing instruments. It just looked like so much fun. I thought that seems like something I'd like. So I went to see one of their performances and they had reconfigured 16th century Commedia dell'arte with stock characters. It just think Punch and Judy for adults. And it was so much fun. And yet they were talking about current political events with such irreverence and such improvisatory wit. I went down, I met them. There was one of the beautiful women in the office typing. And the next thing I knew I was in that company and I got to play this uh, character Pantalone and he's an old miser. And he's, uh, he's just kind of incorrigible. He says horrible things, he does horrible things. And in this play, he was a munitions manufacturer. And as soon as I put the mask on, has a very long nose and a little goatee, and I'm wearing a robe, and I have a little pouch around my waist, which had a little cloth coming out of it. As soon as I looked in the mirror, I heard the voice of my old Jewish grandfather speaking, and the character popped into mind. And Peter Kohan, who I was at that time, just disappeared. No, I wasn't. I was Peter Coyote. He just disappeared. And suddenly I was in the identity of this character and I was fearless. There was nothing I couldn't do. And I experienced a kind of freedom from self-consciousness, shyness, doubt, worrying about what other people would think that was just illuminating. It really just set me free. And on the stage, I couldn't make mistakes. I could say the most horrible things. The first thing he ever said on the stage was I'm introducing my whiny daughter who was just, you know, spoiled and entitled and rotten. And I introduced, I turned to the audience and say, I love my daughter. The reason I love my daughter, she killed my wife in childbirth. And I knew it was like impossible, but the audience found it hysterically funny. So later on, when I began to study Zen, and I began to meditate more, and I began to teach kids in Zen center, the children of the priests, acting, I started to see a confluence between the pursuit of liberation through meditation. And over the years, really over 40 years, I began to work with acting improv exercises, 
And what I realized they did was they pushed people up against their notion of themselves. Normally, we don't see ourselves. But if I change your posture into a posture that's uncomfortable to you and you start saying, wait, that's not really me, you've discovered an edge of the self. So we would do improvises that stretch the bookends of your identity, and make you a little uncomfortable, but in a safe place. And it turned out that when I put a mask on you after a morning's warm up and I hold a mirror in front of you, that mask just wiped out your ordinary personality. And it happened 100% of the time. And I would have each person try on three different masks. And for 10 minutes, they would have an identity which was not them. And the them took away their shyness and self-consciousness. And I realized, wow, this is like enlightenment light. And so I began using it as a loss leader, saying to people, look, you've just had an experience of selflessness cold sober. You've had an experience of total freedom without self-consciousness. So that if you want to make this recallable without the masks, you have to learn how to meditate and you have to learn a Buddhist description of reality. And then I would talk about that. And so I've been doing this for about 45 years. And I've never had people not have that experience of liberation But about five years ago, I started working with a woman who's a friend. We have the same voiceover agent. And she runs a very good school in Sausalito called Voice Tracks. Right, I'm familiar with it. Okay. So I started doing the class there. And one day I started doing, we would do these exercises in the morning, and then I would do a master class in reading in the afternoon. And one day, really just on a hummer. All the kids were good. They were all polished. They all sounded like other professionals they had heard. And I was getting bored to death. And I knew that Samantha wasn't happy either. I said to one of the people, read this in the, in the voice of one of the characters you discovered this morning. And it came so vividly alive, the entire class sat up. It was musical. It was original. It picked every important word in the text. And I suddenly realized that it was applicable. It was a tool. Even though the voice was inappropriate, let's say, you know, imagine Tony Soprano selling a Rolls Royce. It's, it's not appropriate. But once they had broken loose, I could say, read it again in your own voice. And everything was still there. And so during the pandemic, I stumbled on a way, because I couldn't put masks on people, I stumbled on a way of having them take their picture, turn away, make a face, take a picture of it, and then turn back and hold that picture up to the camera and give us the voice. And that was their new character. And it worked pretty well. I wouldn't say 100%, but 95%. And people had breakthroughs of freedom and ease and relaxation and what they discovered was that you're always the best as yourself. As, as uh, um, Oscar Wilde once said, be yourself, every other role is taken. And people don't have confidence in it. After reading, I really want to go out and get a mask. But obviously, it's not the masks we've all been wearing for COVID or even the Lone Ranger's mask. It's really, a, a, ideally, a full face white blank mask, right? Yeah. The, you know, I've been trying to find the, the woman who made these masks for me, these white masks. Some masks live and some don't. I have two. I have some brown masks, which are very good. But my favorite are these white masks with uh, little red lips, like reddish lips. And they have very, they're neutral masks. They don't have a strong feeling, but they have a definite feeling about them. And what's interesting is they change completely with the person that puts them on. So a mask that looks humble on one person will look regal on another person. A mask that looks highly sexual on one person will look sly and snide on another person. So, And some masks don't do anything. They're just not alive. 
And for some reason, I lost track of this woman. I've been on Facebook. I've gone through my contacts and because they're the best masks I've ever used. Talk about the importance in the masking of the mirror and then the warm up exercises. I was interested that you indicated that you shouldn't just put the mask on and expect something to happen, that the warm up exercises and the way in which you use the mirror are really key. Oh, God, I'm just going to bring you with me everywhere, John. You actually read and understood the book. Well, I, re I really want to do this masking thing. So. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to start doing these for the public as opposed to just at, at voice track because people are really after me to do it. And I'm hoping the book might unleash a flood of requests. Um, but here's the deal. I've put the mask on people before, and what I find is it just sort of paralyzes them. They may see a face in there. They may see a personality, but they don't have the expression. They're kind of locked in. So I start with very simple exercises. I say, imagine a little red dot that you could put anywhere on your body, and that red dot will lead you around. So let's start with it on your nose, and I make them exaggerate and walk around the room like this, being pulled by the nose. And then I query them. And I say, how did you feel? Were you human? Were you an animal? What were you? What was the emotional content you got? And then I have them dial it back. And then I have them dial it back again until they could take it out in the street and nobody would stare. It would just, you know, the difference between, let's say, this and that which once you've been sensitized to it, will trigger something. And then I would go to the chest, and then I would go to the belly, and then I would go to the loins. And some things made people uncomfortable, like many women are uncomfortable putting their breasts forward. But in a class, in a safe place, they do it, and they get to explore, you know, maybe they... I've known women who got mature early, like in early grade school, and they started tucking their shoulders in a little because they were embarrassed about their breasts, or maybe they liked them too much, who knows. But we go through all those things, and by the time you've done that for half a morning, your sense, your self is sort of rocked. It's been loosened up. It's been pushed through postures it's not comfortable with. Then I do status exercises. Uh, we all know what social status is. You know, the president's the highest or the king is the highest. Then there's the prince. Then there's the dukes and the earls. But all human conversations between strangers deal in something called status transactions. And status transactions are like signals we send to one another to keep the peace. S high status would say, don't mess with me. I bite. And it signals that by control of the eyes, by control of the head, by stillness, by taking up all the space it wants on the bus or the subway. And low status signals that don't mess with me because I'm harmless, I'm meaningless. And we're taught not to see this, but yet we see it around us every day. Friends don't hold status positions. They, they move them. If you and I are, are buddies and you call me a jerk, I go, yeah, I guess I was off. And tomorrow I might call you a jerk. But at the office or in public or around the water uh, cooler, we're all sending these signals about the space that we hold. So, for instance, a very simple exercise. I divide the room into A and B. And I say side A is high status. And you walk around the room and I say, every time you catch someone's eye, I want you to hold it for a count of five. And then I tell the low status people, every time someone catches your eye, I want you to immediately to look away and then sneak a look back. Well, there are some people for whom high status feels very normal. And there are other people for whom high status feels very aggressive or provocative or threatening. Then I switch the groups. And then we start doing improvs in high and low status, getting people to refine them and get them as close as they can. And then they start seeing that around them in the streets. So once you've been really pushed through, if you're low status and you're forced to be high, if you, if you are not used to presenting yourself, 
straight, if you're not looking to people in the eye, it creates a stress in the ego. And by the time that's been done, when I put a mask on you, you sort of don't know what to do. And you suddenly get this input from this face, which is not your own. And my theory of what happens is that the mind scrambles for coherence. And at the speed of light or thought, it assembles every uh, association you have with that picture. And you coalesce it into an identity. And when and I can see it happen. I'll have people tip their head, turn one way or another, and all of a sudden, you see them gel. And I say, got it? And they go, say, oh, yes. And I say, what's your name? And they talk in a different voice, and I introduce them to the room, and then I bring out, I do three people at a time, and pretty soon they're interacting as these characters. And then we take the masks off and they hold the mask around their belly so that we can see who they were and they talk about the association. Then they trade masks and we do it again. And in each class, they'll find three different characters and there's no more uh, compelling proof that there's nothing like a fixed self inside you if three times in a row, perfectly stone cold sober, you come up with three completely coherent identities and somehow you know everything about them. You know, the relatives, I can ask, who's your kid's sister? It's, it's kind of mysterious, but you have to do the warm up, or else people are not uh, softened up. How are masks like drugs in terms of inducing a temporary transformation? That's a good question. So, <laughs> anyone who's read my books know I have nothing against drugs. <laughs> but let's take psychedelics. Um, I was talking about Michael Pollan about this this morning. Psychedelics can really offer you an astounding experience. Uh, great vividness, great recalibration of the universe. It's, it's coming back in favor now somewhat. It's being used in psychotherapy and various kinds of groups. But to me... Uh, an LSD trip or a psilocybin trip is like taking a grand uh, helicopter to the Grand Canyon. The vista is awesome. It's staggering. It can change your perspective. But if it's a one time, but first of all, you got there in a helicopter and you can't get back without the helicopter. Whereas if you had walked there, which would be the equivalent of meditating, you'd have left your own trail of breadcrumbs, and you could get your way back there. So I'm not faulting it. But if you just have a one-time experience, it's never going to overcome a lifetime of habits and responses. And in time, the, the kind of shadowy sides of your personality will obscure that. Something will be different. You'll have an insight. You'll have a memory. But you need to revisit the Grand Canyon as often as you can to solidify it. So meditation is obviously one of the ways to get there. Uh, in, his, in his book, Changing Your Mind, Michael uh, Pollan talked about uh, an area of the brain called the default mode network. I never knew the name of this. I knew such a thing existed. And the default mode network is what prevents us from being high all the time. Obviously, we would never made it through the crucible of evolution if we were so enamored of, uh, of as your blue butterfly that we failed to notice the saber-toothed tiger behind us. So in terms of efficiency, in terms of predictability, we can operate with very few data points. I mean, all I have to do is see your two eyes and ears and I go, oh yeah, human. I don't, have to, I don't have to pay excruciating attention to every leaf. I know what a leaf is. I know what a tree is. So there's a benefit, but there's also a reductive uh, penalty for it. You stop being completely immersed in the moment. You stop totally feeling life as it unfolds in front of you. And it has to be the way. We couldn't do our jobs, take care of the kids, do all this stuff. But the default mode network relaxes under meditation and under psychedelics. And it allows synapses to make new connections. 
and it allows them to, to forage and break new grounds and get out of the little runnels that they've carved in the mind. And you get new combinations and recombinations of data. And it's very powerful. But again, un until it's kind of committed to a deep knowledge that you can call upon, they just represent peak experiences and they don't necessarily change long-term behavior. So you use masks and workshops, but meditation is really at the heart of your practice. What's the connection between masking and meditation? Well, I start every class with meditation. I teach people how to meditate. Um, in meditation, in Zen meditation, what we do, you're doing three things. You have a little mudra, which I'll show you. It's this pattern with your hands. And this is an attention gauge. As long as this circle collapses, your attention's collapsed. If your thumbs disappear, you know, your attention's collapsed. So we have this mudra and we sit upright with our ears kind of pulled back a little over our shoulders, holding this mudra. We look down, eyes open, 45 degrees. We're not trying to escape this world. We're in this world. And we let our stomach pooch out so that we can breathe to the bottom of our diaphragm. And then we just stay aware of our breath. Sometimes you count your exhales, but you can't get more present than following a breath as it comes out of your nostrils. And by not moving, you're depriving the brain of inputs. You're depriving it of, you know, all those restless twitches and stuff. All that stuff is allowing the mind to just kind of calm down on its own. And the first thing people discover is how busy their mind is. That's why the ancient East Indians used to call it monkey mind. It's just running all over the place. But that's what it does. And one of the things that meditating does is it sequesters the awareness that we've put into paying attention to our posture, our mudra, and our breathing to give ourselves a perch from which we can watch the mind. So instead of being hooked by a thought, instead of, you know, a guy cutting you off and saying, I'll kill that son of a you can say, wow, that really made me angry. Where's that in my body? What really triggered me off? And by doing that day in and day out, year after year, you kind of exhaust a lot of your old narratives. Oh, yeah, my dad did that, but I've been, I've been pissing and moaning about that for 30 years. Maybe I'll let that one go now. So the mask does the same thing in a funny way. The mask short circuits the default mode network because it takes every idea of the self out of it. It just feeds you back information that's totally foreign. So you're not basing any of your choices on an idea of your identity. So when we meditate, we, so Buddhist theory would say there's a difference between the personality, the ego, and the real self, which is the vibrant energy of the universe. Uh, emptiness, Buddhists call it. Um, emptiness extrudes forms moment after moment after moment. Think about a choppy ocean with lots of little peaky waves on the surface of it. Well, each of those little waves rises up into form for a while, then it settles back into the ocean. And when it's in form, we could call it any nameable object in the solar system, a person, a species, a mountain range, a civilization. It comes up into form for a while and it settles back into the ocean. Well, the ocean is the formless pregnant energy of the universe. And what those little waves forget, and what we forget as people, is that we have never for one instant not been part of the ocean. So understanding that, understanding that we are a transitory phenomenon, we are not a fixed sense in any being. We're going to come up into form for a while, but we've never been detached from sunlight, oxygen, microbes in the soil, pollinating insects, the people that grow our food, that ship it, market it, sell it. And so the big view, the big mind is that. The little mind is the personality. And it has a lot of work to do for us, but it's also exhausting. 
because it's a world of contradictions and we're always having to pick and choose. Whereas meditation allows us to slip alongside of it or to drop out from under it a little bit. And in emptiness, there's every possibility. There are no contradictions because what you like and what you don't like are equally contained in it. Is is that a coherent yeah. answer? Yes. And, okay. and, and, and of course, meditation is not something that like that you start doing. What were the some of the challenges you faced originally at the Zen Center in trying to learn to oh meditate? My God. Well, you have to understand that when I came to Zen Center, I was a tangled up ball of barbed wire. I had been living eight years uh, pursuing absolute freedom as only a young adolescent and early maturing young man could do which meant as much sex, as much drugs, as much political ideas, as much craziness as it was possible to, to, to exist with. And then over a course of time, the 60s changed. We had children. Suddenly you couldn't have free-for-all communes anymore. You couldn't have Wino Eddie playing the tom-toms at four in the morning when mothers were waking up to nurse at 5.30 and 6.00. And so people began to look after their, their children and they needed form and they needed structure. And so many people moved away to be closer to schools. Uh, we didn't own our land bases. So I wound up in uh, San Francisco somewhere in 1974, um, father of a single father of a daughter, uh, broke. I'd never made more than $2,500 a year for the last eight years. And I had to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And one of the things I realized was to be responsible for my daughter, I had to stop shooting dope. If I overdosed, they would take her to an orphanage and it was intolerable. So around the time that I got turned on to meditating and sitting Zazen, uh, I found, I interviewed about 10 psychiatrists and picked one that I liked. And we worked together for two years and he died. And I started all over again for another two years. And after about four years, I felt I was pretty grounded. And I felt uh, a kind of trust in meditation. I felt a kind of trust in allowing yeah. forms to control my life. And I began to discriminate between my personality and my big mind a little bit. I was also plagued by shaking. I mean, convulsive shaking when I would meditate. For 28 years, I would shake like I had palsy. It was very embarrassing. Um, there's monks on either side of me who were sitting like oil paintings. And I was like a Jew with a bell around my neck, just flopping in the zendo. It just was awful. And, uh, but I held on to it. And other people were afflicted by this as well. And my teacher one day, late in my practice, 28, 29 years into my practice said, you ought to take a look at that. And I did. And I realized it came from trying too hard. I was holding myself just rigid, trying to be perfect. And my muscles were rebelling. And as soon as I relaxed and just settled into this and stopped the effort that was being dictated by my personality and just let Zazen take over, well, I started to get the hang of it. Yeah. You've noted in the book that meditation and therapy are really two different practices, but you see them working together and you've utilized both. How are they complementary? Well, I think that therapy is kind of the compassion of the West, but it's an ego-based system. And so it's designed to kind of help your ego see the world more objectively. If you're caught in a neurotic loop of some kind, of any kind, you're kind of trapped. But if you begin to work with a therapist and you, excuse me, establish a relationship of trust, they begin, they begin reflecting a more objective world to you. And as that begins to make sense, eventually you begin saying, well, let's see what doctor, what would Dr. Jones say to me here? What would Dr. Jones do? And you begin interjecting the point of view of the analyst. And suddenly now you have two systems, not just one. You're not just constrained in your neurotic loop. 
you have somebody who's an objective critic. And there are lots of theories about, you know, if you release primal trauma or not. My daughter is a, is a therapist. Um, poor girl. <laughs> she had to train herself. Uh, but Buddhism is not an egocentric system. And so for all the, for all the utility of training the ego to see the world more objectively, it's a whole other level to be able to slip outside the ego and not look at reality through a self-centered prism. It's quite different. And it may only last, you know, five or 10 minutes. No one can live in a kind of permanent enlightened state all the time. You're just, you're just out there. But you come back and you come back with the memory of it. And there's a, there's a uh, lovely metaphor that Suzuki Roshi, the founder of my lineage, used to talk about, which was seeing an edge of the moon uh, obscured by clouds, but just the edge of the moon is advanced ahead of the clouds. When you see just that edge, you can sense the roundness of the moon behind the clouds. And enlightenment is a little bit like that. You see the edge of the moon and you also simultaneously remember the fullness of it, even if it's obscured. And so I'm very clear with students and things that uh, Zazen can't cure every problem. And there are problems where it's much better to consult a therapist. If you are distorting reality, if you are overcome by trauma or overcome by you know, ancient rages and things, um, they're going to impede your ability to meditate. And so I always, I always speak well of therapy. And I, I use myself as an example of someone that was uh, greatly helped. And what, how do you see the relationship between your Zen practice and acting? And how has it influenced that? So that's a, that's a tough question. It's an embarrassing question. And the reason why it's embarrassing is um, I'm a pretty competent actor, but I'm not a great actor. Uh, and I realized somewhere in the game, I was never going to be Daniel Day-Lewis or Sean Penn. I just wasn't. I'm kind of a PTSD survivor of a, a lot of violence and a lot of craziness in my family. And one of the ways I survived was by tamping down my feelings and trying to put all my clarity into my perception, seeing clearly and being able to describe it in language. So I became an actor because it was a skill I had and I didn't want to write for money because writing is, hmm, I'm not overusing the word if I say sacred to me, it's really important. And I, I didn't want to have to do foolishness. So I became an actor this will show you how practical I am. I became an actor to support myself as a writer. And I was incredibly lucky. I mean, took me around the world. I became a star in some places, did a number of big films. But I never felt that I was going to make the first uh, rank. I just knew that about myself. And at a certain point, I got both my kids through graduate school debt-free and I did a series in Canada. They sent me this series and I said, oh, I'm playing the grandfather. This is great. The, the, the husband and wife will be the stars and the kid. I'll work a couple days a week. And I didn't read the script. And when I got there and I read the script, it was about a, a grandfather whose grandson is captured, kidnapped, and he gradually goes crazy over four episodes or something. And on my last day, it was 37 degrees below zero, and I'm laying dead in the snow, and extras are tripping over me and saying, excuse me, and stepping on my chest and my hand. And I said, screw this. And I just retired from acting. And um, I still love to do voiceovers. I can do them from home or nearby studios. But when I was acting, the relationship was that meditating takes you down to ground zero. Meditating empties you. And so you're, you're free to receive intuitions and impulses about the character that are not obscured by your thoughts and your intellect. And that's really priceless because most artists I know 
everything starts from a hunch or an intuition. And then you you write a sentence or you make a line on a piece of paper, or you make a movement as a dancer, and then you step back and you evaluate it. And by going back and forth between logic and intuition, that's what the creative process is. It's a problem solving mechanism. And so uh, meditating is one of the greatest gifts I can think of for any artist because it just clears the static and it creates a kind of cloudless sky or maybe a, a foggy sky where the slightest registration of an idea or a thought or an impulse is visible to you and you can utilize it. That's great. Actually, this brings up a question that came in from the audience. How did you start doing narration and did you expect it would be a career? No. So I was actually doing ads uh, when, before I became an actor, when I came in from the cold of the counterculture, I had to make some money. So I made a, a, a CD of myself speaking uh, in about 12 different dialects, you know, telling people what an idiot this guy Peter Coyote was. I wouldn't trust him with a woman. He'd jump on her like a kangaroo. And I took it to every ad agency in San Francisco and it made people laugh and they started calling me and I started getting voiceover work and it was paying triple scale. I was making more money than I had ever made. And somewhere after working on the Arts Council, I'd never even thought of the movies at that point, but I worked for Jerry Brown on the California Arts Council and I was appointed in 75 and I was elected chairman in 76. And it was something I was good at. All my years in the counterculture, I'd learned to talk to every kind of person. And um, the Arts Council became a huge success and it gave me the confidence to realize I didn't have to stay just addressed to the counterculture. And I resolved to try the movies and I'd give myself five years. And if I got lucky, great. If I didn't get lucky, I'd do something else but I wouldn't die with the what ifs. And I got lucky. And uh, I think I lost your question. Sorry. It was just how you started in narration. So oh, obviously yeah. you so started, started in narration with that. early on. Yeah. And then once you get any kind of celebrity, you fall into a category called celebrity voiceover. That's when you're hearing United Airlines commercial, you go, oh my God, that's Gene Hackman. Oh, that's Martin Sheen. Well, I slipped into that. And that was also very remunerative. You know, most people forget that 95, 96% of actors are out of work immediately after the job ends. After E.T., the most profitable film of all time, I was out of work for nine months. After The Jagged Edge, I was out of work for a year. So suddenly you get a, you get a chance to do... Um, you know, Mutual of Omaha commercial or an Apple commercial or, a, you know, car commercial, that's serious money. And I had two kids in private school. I had first one house then and one wife, then an ex-wife and another wife to support and another house. And, you know, your bills don't stop because you're out of work. Another audience question that's related. How is the experience for you working as a narrator for Ken Burns projects? Um, that working for Ken Burns is the reward I got for every good karmic deed I've ever done. Uh, he and I have more fun and there's more teasing and more stuff. And I'll, I'll tell you this funny story about it because it didn't start well. I did a story called the West, uh, which was produced by the young men who produced the civil war for Ken. It was about an eight hour series. And he heard it and he liked it and he wanted me to do the national parks. So someone arranged a meeting and he came in and he's kind of an elfin creature. He's ferociously bright and good humored and just sparkling with wit. But he came in with this pile of scripts and then another pile of CDs, the DVDs on top of it, then a pile of yellow legal pads and another pile of pencils. I mean, he could have it looked like he was on African safari. And uh, I said, what is that? He said, well, these are the scripts and these are the DVDs. So you can see, you can follow the one in the other. And uh, here are highlighters so you can write and you can make notes. I said, oh, no, man, I don't do that. I, I just read it when I get in the studio. 
and there was a glacial pause. And he said, that will never work. You don't know how good I am. I mean, you don't know how uh, impeccable I am. Don't ask me why. I said, well, you don't know how good I am. And there was another glacial pause. And he said, okay, um, I'll rent a studio for a month and we'll try it. And I said, no, there's, there's nine hours. We'll do an hour and a half a day. Just get it for six days. And on the third day, he hopped up and he said, I'll never use anyone else. And, uh, you know, he does. But um, I've done 11 or 12 for him. And uh, we have a lot of fun. And it's just like a master's class and the most interesting subjects on earth. He uses my friend David Keith, let's say, for Ali or for jazz or for Jackie Robinson, where it's not necessarily appropriate for a white guy to do it. But, um, you know, he's, he's great. He's, he's, a, he's a force of nature. Yeah. Uh, Ken told me that story, too. Because uh -huh. I've worked with Ken for over 20 years. Oh, I see. Years. Uh, but that, so it must be true. You both have the same story of how your uh, narration work for him began. Getting back to the book, there's, there are many interesting concepts in there. But I was fascinated by thinking versus non-thinking. Observing your thoughts rather than engaging with them. Is that like being objective about yourself or thinking versus non-thinking? So let's consider for a second that the mind is like a gland for producing images. It produces images, it produces sounds, it produces snatches of conversation, at least mine does. Um, and as they rise up out of nothingness and gel and you feel them and they disappear, that's not actually thinking. Thinking is when you engage with them. So the image that I have is like sitting in a stick shift car. As long as the clutch is in, you can race the engine as much as you want. It's not going anywhere. But when something comes up that you want to engage in, then you release the clutch and you focus the mind on that and do it. So we can call Zazen non-thinking. Um, when you find that you've been carried away by thoughts, uh, then you've, you've dropped your attention. But if you're maintaining your attention, you can just let thoughts come up. You watch them. You feel them. Somebody's calling me. That's so funny. But um, you can feel them and they're not going to bother you because the mind is not going to stop. But you can stop yourself from detaching. I mean, from attaching to it. But my phone is acting like a vibrator. I need to stop it. Well, we while you're start. doing that, um, if you still have the book handy, an audience member has asked if you would please read Six Cold Comforts on page 53. Well, that audience member is very smart because it's open to that because that's where the title of the book comes from. Oh, great. Six Cold Comforts. A burglar sacks your house, dropping a pearl necklace as he leaves. A mugger rifles your wallet, tosses back the picture of your ex-wife. Slitting the tongue of a crow enables it to speak English. How to bring home the bacon in Bengal. Club the baby's foot. Protesting corruption. A man immolates himself. Temporary relief from the cold for homeless vets. Getting what you asked for, served on your lover's heart, salty gravy tears. Cheerful. <clears throat> so here's one more I'd like to read. This is the, probably the newest one that's in the book. Do I have time to do this? Yes, you do. Okay. It's called Hawk Feathers. The tangerine tree, pregnant with its weight of tiny suns, shades my deck, bird feeders, and suet. Television twitters from inside. I've hung hawk feathers on threads to deter the, the birds from smashing the reflections of trees, far hills, and clouds. But still, 
Here's a tiny goldfinch, stunned on the boards. I blow on it and it blinks. Set it near the water dish, stand guard. The hills, the silence of laurel, apple blossoms, plum blossoms. Inside, the president blames a stylish Muslim congresswoman for 9-11. Who will rid me of this troublesome priest? The finch flaps its baby wings twice, lofts its puffball body into the air, falls 10 inches, clutches the thorns of a climbing rose. A sharp-shinned hawk hurtles from within the tangerines, tearing it off into emptiness. My children live far away. Thank you for that. We've reached the point where we just have time for one last question, and I think this may be on a lot of people's minds. In addition to buying the book, what's a good way to get started with masking and meditation? So I would start with meditation. Um, alas, I, I'm the only person that teaches this, and I've been trying for years to kind of train some disciples or train some people to, to do it. But, you know, I have this funny bifurcated history in uh, acting and Zen. Um, I would start with Zen. I would start with, if you could find a group, find people to sit with. It's important. You don't have to join. You don't, it's not like joining a cult. But there's, I mean, you can swing a cat in Sonoma County and hit a Zen teacher. So you can find Zen groups everywhere, and they will teach you. Um, I like the Tibetans very much. They have a lot more fun than the Zen people do. Uh, there are long histories of meditation. And I'd suggest that anybody start with Suzuki Roshi's wonderful book, Glenn Ma uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, which actually has an audio book that I narrated. Um, you'll get a sense just from the meditating. And um, eventually I'm going to figure out a way to take this on the road and do it. And if we can get, I can only teach about 15 people at a time. It's never going to be a mass event. So maybe I'll invite people to put 15 people together and I'll come out and do a day's uh, practice. But Certainly the book will give you an idea and you can certainly practice any of the exercises at home. They're designed for that. And you can, at the end of your first day, try a mask on, look in the mirror, move your head around, see if something happens. If it doesn't, you'll know you need me. All right. Thanks for that. Our thanks to Peter Coyote, whose new book of poetry, Tongue of a Crow, is available at your local bookstore and online. His forthcoming book, the Lone Ranger and Tonto Meet Buddha, Masks, Meditation, and Improvised Play to Induce Liberated States will be published in December. This program has been part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We also want to thank all our viewers for joining us. I'm John Boland, and now this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you, John.